please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Welcome back then as we speak well the nifty is just holding on to the 10350 we'd expect to see some kind of bounce actually coming from these levels because remember the bears are in control uh, uh, for the majority of this uh, series and after a while they are making a lot of money in this series but can we expect a bounce from here well to know that answer we have with us mr ashwini gujral as well as rajat bose ashwini coming across to you first uh, you know we're holding at the 10350 have we fallen enough uh, do you think that we could see a bit of a bounce in the final few hours see for the last uh, two three sessions we haven't really done much broadly you know 10300 10420 so you know the stage is being set up for a bounce which means that if you're a bear you got everything working for you but you still can't get follow through so the moment uh, you know uh, this realization comes in that okay maybe immediately there isn't life below 10300 or say 24800 i think you'll see a strong bout of short covering also uh, you know there are certain large stocks which uh, are getting sold off constantly by fis things like hdfc bank icici bank etc uh, you know once the foot is taken off the pedal there i think the broader market is seeing a lot of buying from the morning lows having said all that uh, persistent is a buy with a stop of 785 target of 815 sun pharma is a buy with a stop of 538 target of uh, 560 and adani port is a buy with a stop of uh, 393 target of 415 and obviously uh, i would not like people to now remain short because uh, the odds of a bounce are increasing by the day okay uh, rajat good afternoon to you um, are you too looking to go long now on some stocks yeah individual stocks yes but uh, not so much uh, positive on the index as such uh, i would say that uh, the index unless it actually moves above say 10380 there about uh it would be very difficult for the index to actually climb up and especially the movement of the bank nifty is not at all encouraging so uh, bound, expecting a bounce in the nifty is a tall order at least as of now uh having said that i would say that individual stocks like say vigard and fsl these are still a buy vigard showing enough of momentum i would put a stop loss at 3234.90 and keep a target of 240.50 this is an intraday trade again fsl is a buy 48.80 is the stop loss and target would be 51.50 and 53 this is not of course an intraday trade you can actually carry it over uh these two stocks looking strong apart from quite a few others that are showing some traction but overall the sentiment continues to remain negative and my view is that we would see 10050 that is testing the 200 day moving averages there about uh, not very long from here okay all right thanks so much ashwini and rajat for joining in uh, and giving us your quick take uh, on the nifty well uh, not too good actually for all the indices but I was trying to look out for some green quality that's one stock that's uh, popped up in trade volumes as well picking up in the last half hour or uh, so that should come up for you on the screen first source remember the markets have been quite weak but something's going on there because just this week itself first source has been seeing a uh, periodic moves and in fact if we just pull up a one week chart you'll see the stock has done quite well so i think you should keep an eye out on that one uh, time technoblast as well it had a dream run then it saw a sharp correction but in fact uh, you know that stock as well is moving higher and volumes as well picking uh, picking up on that one time techno plus uh, well news flow coming through that the government has announced a strategic plan for synergy amongst telecom psus what is the exact nature quantum etc of this plan uh, those details are not yet known but for now the stocks of course uh, mtnl iti um, uh, they've been doing well so we'll wait by and uh, uh, our reporter would be alerting us about what exactly this strategic plan looks like um, uh, but uh, i think sharing of synergies 
always good for this space. But for the moment, let's focus on the real estate space. And it looks like there, the blues aren't going away anytime soon. Anarok's latest report shows a significant decline in new launches and absorption in 2017. In fact, uh, an Ambit report has also highlighted an 8% fall in residential sales over the 2014 to 2017 period. Will we consumer sentiment actually limit the revival from here on. Prashant Thakur of Anarok now joins in with the findings of his report. Prashant, uh, good afternoon. Um, you know, the real estate markets have not uh, been doing well in the residential segment. Um, going forward, uh, what is the way out for these developers? The new launches have definitely declined. In 2007, it, it was, you know, a dip of close to 48%. But again, having said that, you know, developers have been focusing more on completion as well as the uh, uh, the buyers, they have been also preferring the stocks that are ready to move in in order to just you know, avoid the confusion related with GST and any you know, other execution risk that it might have. So, you know, the two factors that have kind of led to the new launches being restricted is definitely one, developers themselves focusing on completion as well as the preference moving towards uh, end users uh, ready to move in segment again uh, if we talk about 2018 so 2018 what we you know anticipate that the new launches would be kind of muted because there would be huge amount of uh, stocks that would be getting completed close to 1,70,000 uh, stocks are getting completed in 2018 which would you know restrict the developers to kind of you know uh, launch new projects because you know, the appetite for new launch is is quite quite less uh, in the market right now. All right, Prashant, uh, just hold that thought uh, for a minute. You know, we have some important flashes that are coming in there. The, uh, you know, the, we were expecting something to come out of this uh, important meeting with regard to what's going to happen on the telecom uh, PSU as well. The DOT is likely to focus on strategic partnership. They're exploring various synergies as well between those DOT uh, POSUs. They're talking about using, uh, you know, the land resources, using resources on the whole uh, as well. The stocks have been buzzing around because we told you that, in fact, yes, there is a meeting that was scheduled for noon. And uh, there are some details that are coming across. I think we have Ashmit who's going to be joining in. They're talking also about sharing of digital, uh, fiscal, as well as research and development infrastructure. So all these pointers are coming through. Just to caution our retail audience, well, uh, MTNL for the last many, many quarters has been making losses. Last few financial years as well as being making losses. Just one financial year, there's a big other income and that's why they de delivered a profit. So just keep that in mind. The market capitalization of MTNL is roughly around 1,550 crores. You have uh, an interest rate of around 1,450. That's for last year. For the nine months ended, well, the numbers were more than 1,100 crores in terms of finance costs. So just cautioning our uh, retail audience out there, be careful on this one. Let's see how these synergies play out and then you can take a call on MTNL. But Ashmit Kumar, he's bringing us all those lines uh, Ashman, fill us in. What are the details? What's uh, the contours? What's the way forward, basically, for all these PSUs? Ashman, I think we have got you on a bit of a strategy or, or a bit of a scratchy line. Uh, can we can we try again? No, it's not working out. It's not working out. So basically, we have some details that are coming in there. We'll try to pull in Ashmit, uh, Sumera. And, um, get a, yeah. You know, Nigel, uh, actually, I would be keen to uh, also speak to an uh, telecom analyst to find out exactly how meaningful these uh, 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 this uh, strategic plan that yeah, has been how announced. How much does it move the needle? Yeah, how much is it actually going to move the needle? Because bulk of it seems like, um, uh, you know, easier resolution, faster That's resolution, right. lack of litigation. But I don't know if there is much material impact in terms of the operation efficiency uh, of the company and that's what I would actually uh, want to find out I yeah. mean as an investor also Absolutely. I think that's what would be uh, key in, yeah. yeah okay Ashmit is back on the line with us uh, Ashmit hi go on fill us in so there is a very concerted effort being made here by the government, by the DOT to be very specific, uh, to have greater coordination, to have greater synergies, to exploit those synergies uh, between the various uh, DOT PSUs. Now as a part of that, there's a multi-point uh, agenda that they have come out here with. Uh, and there are various aspects to that. Uh, first amongst them is to ensure that there is a uh, lower litigation, given that they belong to the same department, various PSUs, there is a concerted effort uh, to develop an institutional mechanism within the DOT uh, for helping in-house in terms of in-house resolution of disputes and not uh, for, the, for these companies to not go to courts. That's one key aspect. The second is optimum utilization of vacant spaces and land and buildings. Uh, given the fact that these are DOT PSUs, they have various land parcels in terms of uh, buildings, in terms of uh, vacant land spaces. 
there needs to be a greater coordination of information between the two, between these uh, PSUs, whereby they can have these exchange of uh, vacant land spaces uh, for uh, use by, uh, by by within the DOT PSUs. There is also concerted effort being uh, pushed in the direction of sharing of digital, physical, as well as R&D infrastructure. Given that they operate in the same space of technology, it's critical here uh, the, the, the trust here by the DOT is to ensure that there's more cooperation between the parties. There is also emphasis in terms of HR, uh, in terms of pooling of R&D resources, in terms of pooling of land parcels that are available. Uh, also, very concerted effort being made by uh, towards pushing the PSU such as CDOT and ITI uh, to partner with each other on projects of national importance like Bharatnet and Digital India. The main thrust here being uh, is a two-point thrust. The first is to explore synergies. The second is to do away with redundancy. That is the thrust here. Uh, there is already, as per the DOT, uh, results are already being shown on the ground. But the effort here, again, is to ensure that there is more synergy, there's more cooperation, and that there is more in-house resolution of issues uh, within the DOT PSUs. All right, Ashmit, uh, thanks uh, for filling us in. Keep coming back to us with more uh, information on that. But I believe we have the former BSNL chairman, Mr. R.K. Upadhyay, who is... Uh, joining us uh, on the phone line. Hi, sir. Thanks so much for joining in. Well, the government of India is talking about some synergy benefits. They're talking about strategic plan, using the resources, uh, optimizing those resources as well. Your initial take on uh, these moves, sir? No, no. These are very good moves, you know, and um, I'll, I'll try to uh, take you back in time uh, to 2011-12, you know, when I was uh, heading BSNL. At that time, you know, we signed an MOU with... Um, MTNL and at that time, uh, on my request, DOT had agreed to constitute a committee headed by the then member Telecom Services, uh, Telecom Commission, uh, you know, to look into this uh, synergies in DOT PSU. Mm. And um, a, a comprehensive report after uh, detailed discussions with all the stakeholders, I mean, all the PSUs, all the four, four or five PSUs, uh, was prepared. And um, I am very happy oh. that it has resulted into uh, a, a formal formal signing of this MOU. I mean, uh, I'm really grateful to the Honorable Minister who has uh, taken right. initiative you know, to bring out that report and also uh, do you know I mean uh, necessary changes which exactly. are required you know as a passing of time. Yeah. You know, so Mr. it's a very good. All in all, it's a very good move. Absolutely, you know, Mr. Upadhyay, you're saying that when you were on the committee, you had proposed this. It has taken a few years, but how much has it moved the needle? I mean, you all would have done some number crunching. What kind of a benefit can we see? I mean, if all these PSUs come together, uh, some kind of numbers because you know they were clearly struggling in the last few years. Actually, you see, it will be very difficult um, for me at this point of time to, you know, or for anybody to get into the number. Yeah. But one, one thing is very clear that all these PSUs, BSNL, MTNL, Indian Telephone Industries, that is ITI, TCIL, yeah. uh, CDOT, CDOT is not a PSU, but CTCR, an autonomous body under Ministry of uh, Communication, uh, like okay. a society. Mm. So all these are a lot of synergies, okay? ITI is uh, having manufacturing capabilities. Uh, BSNL, MTNL are there, the telecom operators from ages, and they have a lot of expertise uh, in execution mm. of projects, rolling out the network, okay. running the services, you know. Uh, right. We also have TEC, which is, you know, I'm an standardization body. BSNL has a quality assurance, uh, which is, you know, good in testing various kinds of uh, equipment. Mm. equipment. So there are a lot of synergies which are existing. And many times what happens, you know, if you lose out on these synergies, then uh, there is a redundant effort on part right. of these organizations. So those redundancies, you know, can be cut down, and uh, that will have a lot of uh, saving potential, saving you of cost. And you know, in Mr. today's world, saving cost means earning money. Right, you know, Mr. Obadai, just one thing, they're talking about optimizing the land resources as well. Uh, you have any numbers in terms of how much was the land that these companies could own? Uh, what could they mean in terms of uh, optimizing these land resources that they're talking about? Some kind of number, sir, would you have? I mean, dated as well. Uh, we'll at least get a brief idea. No, no, then a detailed, uh, detailed stock of um, uh, land resources was uh, taken you know, mm. during the period of 11 to 14. Mm. Um, and everything is documented and codified. So okay. uh, I can only say that, you know, um, too much of land is available at very prime locations with, with at least, you know, BSNL and ITI. I mean, Indian Telephone Industries also has good uh, land parcels. But limited few cities, that is, BSNL has a land parcels across the country and in most prime locations, right? right? So, I mean, I, uh, government will have to really spill out their uh, what kind of arrangement they want to right. uh, to use, utilize Absolutely. these uh, land resources 
for okay. bringing betterment to these PFUs. Okay. All right, Mr. Yeah. Padhya, we'll leave it at that, sir. Thanks much for your time. Uh, telecom expert Sanjay Kapoor also joins in. Hi, Sanjay. Good afternoon. Uh, so we've got some bit of uh, uh, you know forward movement in terms of these telecom PSUs. A strategic plan, so to say, has been announced, uh, but it's lacking in details as to how exactly things will be implemented. I mean, they talk about uh, lack of litigation, sharing of resources, as well as the land, uh, which is uh, uh, in plenty. Uh, but you think this is going to move the needle much for these uh, uh, stocks per se? So look, uh, you know, let's be absolutely uh, pragmatic on what's happening on telecom the world over. I think the industry is now moving at a very, very fast pace because technologies are changing hands and are being upgraded at a much shorter time interval than they ever were. The monies that are required to deal with the newer requirements of bandwidth, uh, video grade networks, digital services, and 5G already being talked about when 4G is not fully deployed, are all testimonial to the fact that uh, we need tons and tons of money and infrastructure to be created to really build a consumer experience. In the midst of all this, a new structure of the industry has also got defined where it seems to be clearly a market of three or four operators because it cannot absorb more than an oligopoly, even in India. I think is now uh, everybody's convinced about it. But while we say all this, there are lots of public sector undertakings, both in the periphery and in the mainframe, mm. uh, who are uncompetitive, right? And they are not uncompetitive because uh, they don't have enough land or they are not uncompetitive because they don't have enough and more people working for them. Yeah. They are uncompetitive because the way they function, right? And uh, nothing stopped them even yesterday from collaborating with each other, right? With or without this MOU. With this MOU, if you're still gonna have distinct organizations and uh, respective heads and respective senior managements at each one of these places, I'm not too sure in a practical life how much of working is Absolutely. gonna change and how many synergies will really get drawn okay. out of this. The okay. second phenomena is that two wrongs don't make a right. If there are two non-sustainable entities or non-competitive industries in the market, by clubbing them together, you're not going to make a competitive, uh, you know, output in the market. That's not going to happen. So, you know, I feel that uh, this is probably the right rhetoric, but I am absolutely skeptical about what it is going to yield okay. and whether it's going to make any one of these public sector entities any more competitive than what they were yesterday. Uh, real estate is a separate entity. I mean, real estate uh, or lack of real estate has not made winners in this market. Mm. Uh, if government wants to monetize real estate, there are 100 ways of doing it, and I think government should do it. Uh, uh, you know, but I don't think that is linked to the success Absolutely. of what is going to happen. Okay. So I, I guess uh, you know it's a tick in the box, but I'm not too sure how much of competitive uh, uh, you know entities will get created out of these moves. Okay, all right, Mr. Kapoor. So we'll have to see. Uh what kind of an output can we get uh, in terms of these measures? Thanks so much for stopping by and giving us those details. Well, just to tell our viewers a few more details, because MTNL is the stock that we're talking about. MTNL for the last few years, well, there's been no big uh, sales uh, growth. The operating losses have continued for the last many, many uh, years. I think, you know, close to around, I think it'll be nearly around seven to around eight years at least that we're seeing losses in terms of operating on the operating basis. The interest cost was nearly around 35% of the total sales. Forget about the operating profit, there's no profit at all. So 35% of uh, the sales, and for the last year itself, you know, the interest cost was nearly around 45 to around 50% uh, of uh, sales. So to turn this around is gonna be a big task. Maybe in fact, yes, it's a tick in the box, but uh, how does it happen? Uh, the stock is up, but uh, you know, just keep all that in mind before you take a call on uh, MTNL. For the global markets has been rising uh, US bond yields. So let's get in a word coming in from Manishi Ray Chaudhary of PNP, uh, BNP Paribas on the new global economic scenario of surging yields and also the higher than estimated Fed rate hikes. Let's listen in. Global Economics Group expects four rate hikes um, in 2018 and one rate hike in 2019. Um, we have actually increased or raised this expectation slightly about a couple of weeks ago in keeping with uh, you know the, how the bond market has been doing and with the inflation outlook. So I think uh, you know even the equity market would now have to come to terms with the possibility of four or five rate hikes 
in the visible time horizon over the next 15 mm. to 18 months. Um, they will also have to come to terms with an elevated bond yield, about 3% or so, being the sustainable bond yield in the United States. And I think that's what global equity markets, including the emerging markets, are struggling with right now. Some of the Asian countries um, do follow the U.S. monetary policy. I mean, Hong Kong has to follow it exactly because it runs a pegged currency. There are some countries, uh, you know, like Singapore, to a lesser extent in North Asia, um, these countries have to follow the U.S. Rate, uh, rate hikes with a time lag, maybe not at the same time. But broadly, we have seen a concurrent increase in bond deals, um, both in, in the emerging markets and in the developed markets. Mm. Um, rising bond deals obviously tend to improve the net interest margins of the financials because yep. they tend to pass on into higher uh, you know, lending rates but they don't necessarily have to give a high deposit rates to their suppliers. Markets under some pressure, ICICI Bank, that's the big one in there, that's taking a leg down and because of that, in fact, the Nifty is not able to get up and going. Even the mid-cap index trading mildly in the red, but it's doing a relative outperformance. The Nifty Bank, it's been the naughty boy, it's down closer around four tenths of a percent. So keep an eye out on that front as well. We'll wrap up on halftime report.